do we need to review mutual induction for a second? I could probably maybe spend five minutes and do a quick version for you guys so you have a good visual of what's going on inside the ignition coil. We think it'd be worth visiting that. How do we make 12 volts into 40,000 volts is, is, is what I want to answer for you. Let's do it. Ignition feed. Going through the primary winding of the ignition coil, then we'll put a switch to ground. This would be housed in some type of module, okay? Whether it be a engine control module, engine computer, ignition control module, or a module that would sit right on top of the coil, uh, which they are different names for it, wouldn't necessarily call it a module, but some kind of electronic device, that is a transistor. I drew it as a switch to make this easy to understand. Okay, and, and by the way, again, this is our primary winding of the ignition coil. Our voltage levels in this circuit be a 12 volt feed. And from this point on guys, as we go through this class, when I say 12 volts, you need to give me a little bit of leeway there. Anywhere from 10 volts to 14 volts. 10 volts cranking, 14 volts charging system, you guys understand when I say 12 volts, and I do this a lot as we troubleshoot, should be 12 volts on this circuit. Should be 12 volts on the circuit. You'll hear me say that a lot. You guys understand what I'm saying is it's an easier way of saying battery voltage. If we're cranking an engine over, battery voltage will drop to 10 volts, 11 volts. Charging system, battery voltage might be 14, 15 volts. So 12 volts, we, we go we're good with that. You guys understand what I'm saying? Battery voltage. So we have steady battery voltage to this coil primary, and then we have a pulsed ground, or you know, I would call this a ground side switched circuit. Uh, this part maybe isn't all that critical right now, but it will be. Section three, we'll be doing power ground side switching. So with this switch off, this voltage in this control wire, this is called a control wire. It's the wire that is being controlled. It's an output, uh, again, section three material. The voltage in that control wire will be what? With the switch in the off position. With the switch off, what would be my voltage level in the control wire? How many of you think it will be determined by the resistance of the primary winding itself? One, just one of you? I think so. Two? You should always hesitate when I ask you a question like that. It's kind of a loaded question, isn't it? <laughs> This is a basic electrical concept that would that is very important to discuss. I don't know if this is the right time to do it or not. I'll at least mention it to you. It doesn't matter if this is a one ohm coil or a 100 ohm coil or a 1000 ohm coil, the voltage level in this control wire will be equal to battery voltage. There will not be a voltage drop in a circuit unless there's current flow. Big big piece of information that you must understand when it comes to troubleshooting. No voltage drop, no current flow. No current flow, no voltage drop. So it doesn't matter what the resistance is of this coil right now. Now, whether it be one ohm, 100 ohm, or 1000 ohm will be determining your amperage through that circuit when it's turned on. However, the voltage in that circuit right now, voltage drop, there isn't one. I think it's Kirchhoff. Uh, some, uh, that sounds like a German name, right? Kirchhoff or Russian? Sure. Russian? 17th century Kirchhoff's law, Kirchhoff's voltage laws is what applies here. Okay, back to the coil itself. We need to make voltage that's much higher than that. So let's do the distributor design that we're talking about. We'd have a secondary winding that would be wrapped around this primary. And the end of this would be what we call the coil tower, right? This blue part would be my secondary side of the coil. So you see the ignition coil is kind of the, the end of the primary and beginning of the secondary, <laughs> or right at the coil is the beginning of my secondary circuit. Everything that I have in red up there would be part of the primary. That'd be the ignition switch, if that's my supply, the primary winding, the control wire, the ignition module. And then, you know, you got cam crank signals that are coming in here to tell the module what to do. That's all primary stuff. The blue stuff's secondary. So we're on the secondary side. We need to have, on average, I've been asked this recently, what's typical idle 
voltage on an ignition system and what I have seen over the years is around 10 kV. That's just to fire that spark plug to overcome the air gap, which is the resistance in a secondary circuit. 10,000 volts we need minimum. I don't wanna say minimum. I've seen them fire at six and seven and eight and 11, 14, around 10 on average. Cars idle, 10,000 volts. And then 20,000 volts, 25,000, maybe 30,000 volts under load, high pressure situations. We, need, we have this big range of voltage we need. Where is it coming from? That's what we're doing right now. I think it's important to have this perspective so when we start talking about scope waveforms, I can explain them to you and, and, and show you what we're looking at. All right, so current flow occurs in the primary, guys, when the switch closes. When that switch closes, we will then cause current to travel through the primary winding and it will go to ground in that circuit. What that does is it creates a magnetic field. So we will generate this field around this circuit that surrounds both primary and secondary windings. So a little note here, I guess we could, we could add is let's talk about ignition dwell. Does anybody know what that means? Amount of time that current is flowing through the primary circuit. There's other ways to define that. On old point type ignition systems, you had a mechanical set of contacts that would open and close and control the coil. The points when they were closed would be the equivalent of this switch over here being closed. So you could define dwell as the amount of time the points were closed. Isn't that the same thing as current flowing though? If our points are closed, we're grounding the coil. It's the same thing. We don't have to worry about this, guys. I'm just giving you a, a piece of information that will help you on an ASE test someday. And also, so you have an idea of what I'm talking about later when we start doing some waveforms in section 22, where we have some no start, no spark situations. And I start mentioning how poor that dwell time looks. So when we make a coil fire, it's important that we get this magnetic field that surrounds this winding, that we get this field to be very strong. We want this field to be as strong as we can make it. That is known as coil saturation. Coil saturation would be that when we saturate the coil with a magnetic field, that means it won't get any stronger than that. So it's important that our dwell time is long enough to saturate the coil all the time. Again, not something we really worry about too much. The engineers do all that for us. You just need to know what it is. When we saturate a sponge with water, does it hold any more water? No. When we saturate a coil with a magnetic field, does it get any <coughs> stronger if we continue to add current or lengthen the amount of current time and the answer is no we just make heat so it's an important engineering engineering type characteristics we got to worry about coil saturation mutual induction self-induction is a factor here now let's do self-induction first do you guys remember the the characteristics of making voltage with magnetism three main things with magnetism we need to make a voltage. The point here is self-induction, mutual induction. We, we, how are we making this voltage, right? Uh, there's three main things. The first one was we need a magnet. I need to move the magnet. So we'll say motion and one more, it's a conductor. I need those three things, guys, to make voltage. You ever see those flashlights with no batteries? and you shake them and you, they're clear and they're see-through and you got this little magnet you see floating up and down on the, on the tube of the, of the flashlight. Yeah. And it's got these coils at the top and bottom. If you look close, what are we doing? We're inducing voltage into a capacitor that stores that with these principles. We have a magnet, we have to move the magnet, and the conductor is what we need to create that voltage. The voltage gets created in the conductor. And these are things that, you know, just, you just need to accept it. So motion magnet conductor, can you see right now that we have all three? Um, the, what's the motion though? Is the motion the is that field 
the magnetic field is moving and expanding. This green field that I drew over here uh, is moving and expanding. We don't make spark yet, but there's something that that will do to a primary circuit. It will induce some voltage and we're coming up on that. So that's important. Think about this winding having an effect, being affected by that moving magnetic field. We'll come back to that. So now the field's saturated, right? My switch is closed, my field is saturated. This is the moment where our spark is going to come from. We let go of our ground. So what do we do with current flow? We stop current flow, dwell is done. The field here is going to collapse. It's a very strong field and it collapses very rapidly across a whole bunch of windings. With these three characteristics, the stronger the magnet, the more voltage we make. The faster the motion, the more voltage we make. And the more conductors we have, the more voltage we make. Still in the primary side, guys, we're not talking about secondary yet. What we'll see, if I were to draw this primary side over here, if I were to draw this waveform, I'm, I'm connected to the primary with a scope. Here's what I'll see. I'll see a line like this. This is 12 volts. And then when the switch closes over, over here, I see this. That makes sense? Voltage is going to drop. More to that later. And what we'll see is how long this switch is closed over here will be how long we're low. And then when the switch opens back up again, if you weren't being trained in this topic, you might think that it would just come back like that to 12 volts. But it doesn't. It doesn't. It spikes up real high. We'll call it 400 volts. Not all of them will be that high, but 400 volt spike. Where's that spike coming from? It's the collapse of that magnetic field across itself. They, they, that's, this is what they call self-induction. We induced a high voltage spike in this coil winding. Where did it come from? Collapse of the magnetic field. Guys just accept it. Say, okay, yes. It's there. Every single coil of wire that makes a magnetic field, when you shut it off, you will have a spike, including relays and solenoids. In relays and solenoids, the spike is not desirable, but it's there. In an ignition coil, this is a desirable effect because this secondary winding would have 100 times the number of conductors. So now it's simple math and knowing where this 40,000 volts is coming from. What's 400 times 100? 40,000. Where is the 40,000 volts coming from in, in an ignition coil? That's the best I can do. That same magnetic field that surrounds the primary, that spikes the primary at 400 volts, which really, that isn't our main intent of the primary. We're not worried so much about that primary spike. It's just there. We're using that primary field to collapse across the secondary that has 100 times the number of conductors. 40,000 volts this coil produces.